Gluten sensitivity is a complicated thing. You're put into one of two buckets. People that have celiac and can't deal with gluten at all, or no issues whatsoever. And anyone that has any experience with discomfort surrounding foods that have gluten, well, they know that there is a scale in between there. And perhaps it's not a written scale, perhaps it's not an even really discussed scale. But if on one hand you have an extreme situation, on the other hand you don't, there has to be a middle ground. Now, there are various discussions online and in the sort of health sphere about this. Like, is there a gluten intolerance? Is there bloating? Is there brain fog associated with it? And then begins the list of questions that come up in other categories. Like, is it the quality of the wheat? Is it the person? Is it what's put on the wheat? But one thing that's very interesting is that when people go to Europe, they seem to have better results with handling gluten. And I can speak anecdotally, I have sensitive uh, responses to gluten. My wife has sensitive responses to gluten. And when we were in Europe, gluten didn't impact us nearly as much. In fact, the only time that I personally had an issue with gluten was relatively short term and come to find out that it was bread that was imported in and it wasn't like local fresh baked bread. With celiac, you respond to the proteins that are in gluten, that are in the bread. So in this case with wheat, you're going to have alpha gliadin and gamma gliadin. And when these proteins are recognized in the body, it triggers an autoimmune response that forces the body to react to these already existing proteins that are near the stomach and near the intestine to begin with. So because they're in such close proximity when someone consumes gluten, it triggers this response. There is some evidence to suggest that the fermentation with sourdough changes the structure of the gluten itself. It changes the structure of the alpha and the gamma gliadin to a point where, hey, maybe it can slide by slightly in an unrecognized form. Now, one thing that I wanna say first and foremost is that if you have celiac, I don't really recommend you go eat sourdough. That's not how it really works, but I do think when we start looking at sensitivities and people that have issues with gluten, this could be what's going on, like moderate issues. They can have sourdough because it changes the structure. It changes the actual physical structure of the protein. There was even a study published in microorganisms that found that when wheat is being fermented, like when flour ferments, the interaction of the organisms, like the bacteria feeding and cross-feeding multiple bacteria, changes the ribosomal protein structure to make it more stable. Okay, so it actually changes and makes it a more functional protein, which is interesting. It sounds complex, but basically makes it more easily assimilated by the body. The other thing that happens is you change the pH value. So you lower the pH or increase the acidity when you ferment bread, when sourdough is fermenting. This increase in acidity or lowering of pH increases the amount of what are called proteases, which are enzymes that break down protein. So a lot of times when people consume bread, they're not necessarily having issues with the starch, the carbs, they're having more of the issues with the proteins. And if you're increasing these proteases, you digest that, you don't have as much of the bloating and things like that. Now again, I'm not saying 100% that this is the issue, but if we take care of our gut microbiome, we take care of our gut, we take care of like how we produce enzymes and we eat fermented foods, fermented foods are notoriously good for the gut, right? That's why we have like prebiotics and probiotics. We want a fermentation aspect and then we want an additive aspect. FYI, for those that like prebiotics and probiotics, I put a link down below for seed. It's a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. Now, it's not gonna make it so that you could eat bread without a problem. That's not the purpose of it. It's to help recolonize. So you've got the prebiotic and the probiotic, so a capsule inside of a capsule. So the prebiotic digests first, and then the probiotic kind of has a multi-stage delivery where it's potentially colonizing in different stages of the gut the way that it's supposed to. The bacteria has the highest likelihood of surviving, unlike most probiotics where you take them and it's all just obliterated in the hydrochloric acid of your hostile gut. So this is a whole different level. So anyway, that link down below, that's a 25% off discount link. So it gets you 25% off their, what is called DSO-1, Daily Symbiotic. I do highly recommend you try it out. Again, it's not gonna make it so you can eat whatever you want. That's not how it works, but it can definitely improve your gut health. And that's something that I think all of us are looking for. So that link is in the top line of the description underneath this video. The other thing that we really forget to look at sometimes is the simple act of fermentation increases enzymes, right? You're gonna increase phytase. So 
Phytic acid is something that's going to be in wheat. When you have bread, normal store-bought bread, you're going to have phytic acid. And that's going to lock up a lot of minerals, it's going to lock up a lot of vitamins because it's a binder. This can not only make it so that you're not getting nutritional value out of bread, but it also makes it so that you're not really digesting the bread or those components as well. You're binding to iron, you're binding to things. And this could be problematic because it can make them stick around in your gut longer and potentially chelate and have issues there. So you do need to be careful with that. Point is, a little bit of fermentation goes a long way. And we see it again with fermented vegetables, fermented meat. The same goes for fermented bread, right? It's just like fermented dairy, you're getting a benefit from it there. Then there's something called xylemase. Xylemase helps break down what is called hemicellulose in the cereal like cell walls. So again, if you're looking at a cereal grain, an actual grain, it's going to have cells and these cells are going to have rigid cell walls. This xylemase breaks those cell walls down. So then you have potentially better digestion of those, right? That's gonna make a big difference in just the bloating and just the overall quote unquote digestibility. Then of course there's amylase. Amylase just breaks down the starch chains to begin with. So again, if something is sitting in your gut for a long period of time, that's gonna be uncomfortable. One of the things that people forget is that when you first start eating sourdough, sometimes you get a little bit of some gassiness that comes with it. That sort of gassiness that might come with sourdough is very different from the gassiness that might come from like a refined sugary type bread that you're getting on a regular shelf that's been sitting there with stabilizers and emulsifiers and sugar and not fermented barely at all. What's happening here is you're having a higher level of resistant starch. So type two fermentation, which is common with sourdough, it's going to change some of the starches in the bread so that they're semi-indigestible. So it makes it so they become what's called a resistant starch. Now I've talked about this in the case of like high blood sugar and things like that. You can cook a potato, for example. Cook a potato, let it cool down, and then eat it after it's been cooled and it has a completely different molecular structure and a different starch structure altogether. So much so that your body doesn't really digest it, it just feeds the bacteria in your gut. The bacteria in your gut can eat that starch, but your body doesn't break it down. We don't have the enzymes to break those resistant starches down. The fermentation of sourdough bread actually creates resistant starches. So it becomes a prebiotic food that is good for the gut anyway. So with this, sometimes you'll notice some bloating that occurs. Sometimes you'll notice that. That's entirely okay, especially if it starts to subside as your body develops more of the bacteria to deal with it, right? The gas forms as a byproduct of sort of the slow digestion of it. If your body knows how to deal with it, it's not as problematic. Now, another thing that I've talked about in another video where I talked about kind of the benefits of how sourdough works is when you ferment, you inhibit what is called saccharification. Now, I'm gonna read you a quote from a study that looked specifically at saccharification and how it impacts the human body after like, say, eating sourdough. By inhibiting saccharification, sourdough fermented foods may reduce the production of hyperglycemic reactive substances, thus lowering the glycemic index. And this comes out of the research where we were looking at, hey, how come we can eat sourdough and have less of a glycemic response. Like what is happening there? One of the components of this is of course the fact that you're inhibiting saccharification. So you're slowing down the sugar breakdown and you're making it so that overall you're having less sugar kind of released. Because of course it's a starch. A starch chain is glucose molecules all bound together. And when we digest them, they separate into glucose molecules. But if you have saccharification, things are going to stay in a different form. Sourdough is totally different. But then when we look at the overall European side, there's the potential that they don't use as much like glyphosate, right? That's definitely something that is a valid consideration. There's also a difference in the amount of say, red wheat, like the kind of wheat that is used. So in that case, the wheat that is used there seems to have a lower gliadin content to begin with. So when you have lower gliadin already, and remember gliadin is typically the problematic protein. Let's say you have half the amount of gliadin, and then you have its sourdough format where it's been fermented anyway, changing the structure of the alpha and gamma gliadins anyway. Whoa, you're just like limiting that significantly. So someone that has a gluten intolerance could possibly handle sourdough in, the, in America, but if they went to Europe, they probably increase their chances of handling sourdough significantly. And if there is a potential inflammatory response for people, that's gonna carry over and you're gonna notice that you feel differently. Where I do get a little hung up and I have to raise some question with myself is like, okay, Europe will not allow the import of like wheat from America. Now, who knows, right? Europe, a lot of these countries have very high standards with the quality of their food. We know that in the United States, our food standards are not high, unfortunately. 
as someone that runs a nutrition channel is something that really frustrates me. So the fact that they won't import US food in into the EU, I mean, that does raise some question. But I don't think it's everything. And I wanted to create this video so that people didn't think that it's, it's just like a naturalistic fallacy. It's just like, hey, it's higher quality, and that's why it's not happening. I mean, there is actual difference in structure. And then there is actual difference in the demand for bread, right? People demand fresh baked bread. In the US, there's not much demand for fresh baked bread. We don't care. We go to Costco and we get our bread that's been sitting on the shelves for three weeks and we don't care because bread is just a delivery mechanism for all kinds of other garbage we're shoveling into our faces. Whereas in Europe, there's like an actual demand. We want fresh bread that's baked this morning and we want it now, right? That difference is everything because they're actually eating freshly fermented real bread. So it sounds like it's just something like, hey, they demand bread, they eat so much. Why are they slimmer then? Well, it's because they demand high quality. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.